And let's turn our Bibles to two places. Can you handle that? Two places. Let's first go to John chapter 18. It's our, been our normal text that we've been going through. We're just going to read one verse, and then after that, we're going to read a, a section in Matthew, and then we'll stay, we'll stay in that um, text for the rest of the time today. So if we got to have one thumb in John 18 and the other thumb in Matthew 26. I don't, that's not too big of an ass. You guys could do that. You guys are solid. Um, you, guys are, you guys are way ahead of me, for sure, um, most of the time. All right, let's read John 18, and let's just read one verse, verse 24. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now let's turn over to Matthew chapter 26. And let's begin reading in verse 57, Matthew 26, 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found no one. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at least, but at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Let's pray together. Father, it's really hard for us to read these verses, to, to, to read about Jesus being so mistreated, Lord. But we also know you have purposes for it in our hearts, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that as we yield our hearts to you now, for you to speak to us regarding any of these things, would you accomplish your perfect plan through our lives as, as a result of these verses? We want to be made more like Jesus. We want to have more of his heart. We want to be led by him. We don't want to be a dead church, Lord. We want to be an alive church, an extension of you in this world. We don't want to be other-centered and salt and light. Lord, help us to do that, Lord, as we are arrested by the beauty of your love extended through Jesus and what he suffered on our behalf. I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to be bold in sharing, our, in sharing that gospel with lost people. Lord, this world is filled with lost people, and you've tasked us with your great commission to be able to share the good news of the gospel with them. So use that, these verses and, and, and all that which you have for us planned, even things we don't even know about yet. We pray, Lord, that you would accomplish those purposes in and through our lives, and we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're in the middle of the events that... Um, led to Jesus' death and resurrection. We have seen Jesus betrayed by Judas. Judas was accompanied uh, by hundreds of Roman soldiers and the temple guard, the assigned Levites that were there for security purposes on the temple mount uh, there. And during Jesus' arrest, he remained in control the entire time. We highlighted that two weeks ago how he remained in control the entire time. There was never a time in all of this that Jesus was out of control, where God wasn't sovereign, where things weren't ordained. And so things are not out of control. And it's important for us to understand that. Even during his arrest, even during all these things, he was not at the mercy of sinful man. He controlled everything. He said to Peter, I can call 12 legions of angels. And one angel, as we know from the Old Testament, killed 185,000 Assyrians, just one angel. So this, he was allowing this to happen. He controlled the dialogue. He controlled the questions. He caused soldiers to withdraw and fall to the ground. 
that should have been a big wake-up call for them that they're not doing uh, the right thing. He remained calm. He remained surrendered to the Father. He was submitted. All of that already happened in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And he asked the Father, there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But there was silence, and he surrendered to that. It was all part of a divine plan where he could be both the just and the justifier all at the same time. How was God going to remain just and yet save sinful man? The perfect answer was Jesus dying for us because he could, he could extend what was needed to extend to mankind and at the same time be the one that accomplishes it because he's the only one that could accomplish. And we would never think this up in a million years. We would never think up this plan. You know, sometimes I'll see uh, Christians post um, scriptures and some of them are out of context, to be honest. And one of the ones that's out of context Probably the most famous one that's out of context is when it says, Paul wrote and said, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared in advance for those who love him. And they quote that in the context of heaven, but it's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the wisdom of God. If you read the whole chapter, especially the next verse, he says, but he's revealed it to us. So he's talking about the wisdom of God that has been hidden related to the gospel And that God's plan uh, circumvented man's wisdom in providing the good news of the gospel and the plan of salvation. That's the context of that verse. Yes, heaven will be far beyond what we imagine, and and it'll be wonderful. But But that plan of salvation, that gospel, it was hidden. And it was the wisdom of God, not in the wisdom of man, that revealed those things. And, and he uses the word mystery. It's a mystery. And the biblical definition for mystery is something that was hidden before, but now it's revealed to those who have the Holy Spirit and can be able to discern these things. So man would have never thought this up. Man automatically thinks that we can earn our way into a right standing with God through works, through religious activity. So many people, when you ask them, if you were to stand before God and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? They almost always say, because I, I'm a good person, or I believe in God. All these things uh, that the Bible does not say. And if we're going to have our eternity based on some, having the right answer, we need to find out what God says. Who cares what we think? We need to go with what God says, and what he says is the plan of salvation. We never would have dreamed that God would have made it a free gift. We never would have dreamed that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We never, would never expect or never think that God would be so gracious because we're not gracious. We're not like God in that way, and we want things to be earned. But he said the wages of sin is death. So what we earn is death as, as a result of our sin. So he offers salvation as a gift, and it's a beautiful gift. We just, it's just there for the asking. It's just there for the receiving for us to do that. He's willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Not a, a really small amount of a number of people. He's, he's died for all mankind's sins. And he's willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance. So now we've reached what I call the sham trials. <laughs> because they are a sham. According to their own law, because of their own traditions, it was a sham. It was absolutely illegal. So we've already seen, and we saw this last week, Jesus went before Annas. And really, John's the only one that records the trial of Annas. And uh, we went over the background of Annas. Annas had been the the official high priest about six years before this. He's referred to as the high priest because the people never stopped um, recognizing him as the high priest, even though Rome installed their preferred high priest. They started doing that where they felt like they had the freedom to, to install whatever high priest they want because they felt it helped them be able to control the people to have a high priest that was friendly to them. So Annas was was like the godfather of high priests in in this time because he had served there, but also, and at some point, five of his sons and one of his grandsons are going to serve as the high priest. And right at this point, Caiaphas, his son-in-law, is the current high priest. That's why it refers to them both as high priest. So just a little bit of background on that. So this was a family affair for him. This is something that um, they, they, they greatly respected him, and, 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 but he was really 
corrupt because he was using the marketplace in the temple. Jesus cleared out the temple twice, at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. And the people that were hurt the most were those that were in leadership who got a percentage of all these profits of these money changers and people that were selling animals and ripping people off because the Jews had to come. Every male adult had to, I mean, every male Jew from around the world had to come three times a year for the feast. It was in the law. They had to bring offering. They had to bring money for the, for the temple tax and all these things. And so they had to exchange money. We went through this and we went through uh, that in the book of John in, in, our, in, our, in our book that we're studying. But he was, he was, he's even written in the Mishnah, their commentary, how, how uh, Annas, Annas's bazaars, meaning his marketplace, was ripping off the people. We've also seen that Peter denied the Lord three times. We saw that last week. And he needed to be humbled and broken to be usable. Anyone that God uses in a significant way has to go through a process of being humbled and being broken before the Lord. Because we're impressed with ourselves. I don't know if you notice that. We're impressed with ourselves. We think we're really bringing something to the table regarding our service to the Lord. But anyone that's used by the Lord in any significant way knows that by the time God uses you, he's already broken you and shown you that you have nothing in yourself to offer. Just being a willing vessel. And even God gave us that free will. He even, he even, he gave us that. I remember when I was a new Christian, I was saying, okay, I know I didn't get saved by, it was totally wrong. And the Lord dealt with me on this, but I was saying, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm saved by grace, but at least I was smart enough. <laughs> it's so funny. Like as a new Christian, the things that you say to the Lord, at least I was smart enough to see the truth. You know, he's like, oh, really? Who helped you see the truth? You know, it all goes back to him, you know, but there was this process of 12 years for me. I was called to be a pastor in 1991. I was a year old in the Lord. Didn't know what that meant. I was very offended by that, honestly, because I didn't know what that meant. And there was 12 years of character development and, and, and brokenness and God saying, okay, you think you're ready? Well, look at this. What about this right here? What about this? You're not wise. You're not that wise. You don't have wisdom like you think you do. So there's brokenness. And brokenness in part, um, what's included in that is unmet expectations. This is where we stumble the most related to our walk with the Lord. Because we think God should work a certain way, and he doesn't work a certain way. And, and usually it involves something that's related to trials and difficulty. And that brokenness, there's other parts to the unmet expectations, but you see that he works in us and he's patient and he's, he keeps taking us in terms of being, letting us be a project and being gracious and all these things. And we get less and less impressed with our own wisdom. We get less and less impressed with what we bring to the table. This is everything that, that Peter needed to learn. Though they all deny you, I will never deny you. Or they all, you know, he was making all these sweeping generalization things about, um, everybody else compared to himself. And I'm sure the other disciples were like, come on, give me a break. And they're all making their case about who's the greatest. We forget that. Again, it's been a while since we've talked about it, but even in the upper room, before they wa Jesus washed feet, they're still fighting about who's the greatest. I'm sure they were experts at making their case, why they were the greatest, you know? And, and, but, but, there's nothing that we can add. There's nothing that we can add that would count for anything. That's why Jesus told them in that upper room that apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. You know what nothing means in the Greek? Nothing. That's right. Well, it means something, but it means nothing. So, so they, that just smite their pride. That just struck down their pride because they want to feel like they were bringing something. So the, the self-dependence and pride has always been an enemy to fruitfulness. Before Peter deni Peter's denials, Jesus said to him in the Garden of Gethsemane, said this, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. That's the part we didn't see in John because John doesn't include that. But Luke did. And, and, and Satan was requesting by name, <laughs> Simon, to sift him as wheat. And, and, but Jesus prayed for him. And that's all that matters, right? And Jesus has been praying for Christians for 2,000 years. 
you know, and, and he's praying for us. He's always making intercession. That's what makes him this amazing high priest because he makes intercession and he's been tempted like we were in all points yet without sin. So he, he can understand what it's like to be tempted. So Peter needed to that breaking and he did strengthen his brethren when he returned to him. He strengthened his brethren, but the breaking was necessary. Now today we're going to mainly see Jesus brought before Caiaphas where Jesus will remain in control, just like he's been through all the way up to now. He's going to remain in control the entire time. Nothing's careening out of control. He's in control. And, and even through the beatings and being spit upon, he remains weak or meek rather. Meek is not something, a word that we use a lot. I think we should. Meek means power under control. The famous example is a trained horse. I don't know when's the last time you stood next to a horse, but it's pretty impressive the, how, how muscular they are and how strong they are. And if, you, if they don't want you to control them before they're broken, they're not, you're not going to control them. The process of breaking a horse is the process of causing them to be meek, to have that power under control. And, and, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. But sometimes we don't rely upon God for self-control in the moment because we're trying to do things ourselves. But God calls us to just ask Him for the power, ask to be refilled with the Holy Spirit, depend upon Him. And so this, He remains meek this entire time. The ultimate power was present. God in human flesh was present. And, and, and so the title of the message this morning is The Meek Creator on Trial. And so we, we, read that, we read that one verse in John, then Anna set him bound to, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. First of all, he didn't need to be bound. He was going willingly. But he sent him to Caiaphas. Anna tried to get him to confess things and try to, to get some information from him. And, and Jesus asked him questions. And he, he was, you know, offended by how Jesus answered all the, those things. And we saw that last week. So let's pick things up in Matthew 26. Look at verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So they take Jesus away to the home compound. You could probably say it's a compound of Caiaphas, the high priest. We're told in the verse, the scribes and the elders were assembled, but it's not likely that all 70 of the Sanhedrin were present. We don't know for sure, but it's likely that they weren't all there. This wouldn't happen until the morning when they do meet. They all meet in the morning. So there were all kinds of laws broken, which we'll get into in a little bit, but um, they were not seeking truth. They were not trying to figure out what happened. They believe they know what happened and what he was about, and they don't care. They're just trying to get him put to death. Now, you may remember that that whole prerogative of putting someone to death, having capital punishment, was taken away by the Romans. The only exception was if someone, a Gentile, was in the court of the Gentiles, and he crossed over into the court of the women and went to the Jewish section, Rome did allow them to put people to death. That wasn't happening all the time. Um, that's a big deterrent. They had a big sign there even. So that's the only exception. And then they ignored this with Stephen. You may remember in, in the book of Acts where they stoned Stephen when they, Saul of Tarsus was there approving and holding their coats and outer garments and all of that. So they violated that. They hated Stephen so much they didn't care. They just wanted to do that. They were so ravenous uh, for, for murder. But um, um, they, they, they would... They would break all these laws and we'll go over them and everything, but they're not seeking anything to be fair. They know that they believe they know the outcome. They're going to make sure this happens at all costs. So they're they're And this is so foreign to what they would normally do. It's not like they had a habit of doing this. This was such the exception. They followed everything to the T on, on normally, but this was extraordinary circumstances in their minds. And they need to make sure that Jesus was put to death. Now, John's also still tracking Peter, we're told in verse 58, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So Peter is still wanting to see what's going to happen to Jesus, 
so he's staying near enough to see it, but he's staying at a distance here. And it says, the end of verse 58, to see the end, to see this to the end, to see what was going to happen. So he followed him at a distance and went from Annas' home to Caiaphas' home. Verse 59, now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at, least, but at last, two false witnesses came forward. And they, they needed at least two because the law says that every matter needs to be established by two or three witnesses. They had to have some semblance of that they're following the law and the rules and everything, but, but they weren't. They were just very sloppy. And there's all kinds of things we'll talk about in a minute that they completely ignored. So these, there's nothing fair about the, this trial or what's going even for future trials. It's just an absolute travesty. And, and so you have to really think about what's happening here. They were, these were the custodians of the law. These are the leaders of Israel. And they're willing to um, lead the people in the wrong direction, away from the Messiah. God wanted them to lead them in the way to the Messiah, but they were hungry for power. And, and they wanted the esteem. They wanted the respect. They wanted the worship. They wanted all those things. They didn't want a threat to the, to the status quo. And that's what Jesus was. And he called them on the carpet, so to speak. He, he, he confronted them and told them, unless your righteousness exceeds the, the, the Pharisees, you'll by no means enter in the kingdom of heaven. So their righteousness looked great on the outside, but inside Jesus said that they were full of dead man's bones and they need to clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside of the cup would be clean. So they, they were told they sought false testimony. Just such a crazy thing to think about these leaders that held to the law. They were upset with Jesus because he was, his disciples were eating on the Sabbath. You know, all these things they would strain in a gnat. You know, they would, they would do all these things that would just try to obey the, by the smallest things, but yet they're actually willingly seeking false witnesses. It's, it's crazy. Jesus never did anything wrong. They needed false witnesses because no one's going to testify honestly about Jesus because there'd be nothing to accuse him of. Jesus did nothing but good. He did nothing but good in, in the lives of people. At one point he says, who among you convicts me of sin? To the Pharisees, he said that. They could not legitimately point to one thing. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people don't realize that the law prohibited false witnesses. <laughs> and, and these leaders had no problem committing that sin. I want to read to you from Deuteronomy 19, verses 16 through 19. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing... Then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother, so that you shall put away the evil from among you. So if you lied and gave false witness against a person, then you could receive, if you were caught, you could receive the same punishment that you believe that they should experience if they had actually done the thing that you're false testifying about. And these people didn't care. These leaders did not care one bit. They didn't care if people found out they were doing this. They was just so brazen to be able to get false witnesses against them. And, and so, in fact, if you think about it, according to the law, they were supposed to receive death then because they were as if they were supposed to receive the punishment that Jesus was supposed to receive. They said he's worthy of death from blasphemy. So actually, because of their, their producing false witnesses, they should be getting death as a result of, of this. And they absolutely have no fear whatsoever. Now, if Jesus really wasn't who he said he was, then Jesus would have been guilty of blasphemy by saying this. But the thing is, he was telling the truth. He was telling the truth of who he was. He was the son of God. He was the Messiah. So he can't break the law selling the truth about himself. He is the Messiah, the very one that inspired the law of Moses. And, and, and through the Holy Spirit, he's, he's there right before him. Now, one of the false accusations we see here is in verse 61. And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God 
and to build it in three days. Now, in John chapter 2, we looked at this, chapter, uh, verses 19 through 21. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He didn't say the temple of God. He said this temple, talking about his body. So they misquote him. They take him out of context there. And so it was a big deal to speak against the temple. It was a, it was a big thing. If you spoke against the temple, they could do a lot of things to you. But Jesus didn't respond the way that Caiaphas thought he should respond. Jesus wasn't trying to save himself. He was submitted to the cup that God had, the Father had given him. He had submitted to it. This wasn't normal for defendants. This wasn't normal. They would do whatever they could to defend themselves. Jesus wasn't defending himself at all. He wasn't trying to prevent this. He, he knew this was the Father's plan. He was going along with this. He was submitted to this. He trusted the Father. He trusted that this was the plan and it was best. So because of this abnormal response in Caiaphas's eyes, Caiaphas responds in verse 62 when he says, And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God, Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. The high priest could put somebody under oath, and they would have to tell the truth. And so um, that's, and, and that's why he says there, by the living God. You see that in the middle of verse 63? I put you under oath by the living God. What he's saying is, you cannot lie, because God is alive, and he's watching what you're saying right now. And he is entrusted with me the, this purpose of getting you to tell the truth so well, but it's such a sham because he's not concerned about truth. He's already violating truth by getting false witnesses and doing all the other things that he's doing that weren't aligned with uh, the law or their tradition. Uh, and so he's a liar. So it was a big deal. I do want to mention for a second here, his, his, at the end of verse 63, it says, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. A common, a common basically attack on the messianic mission of Jesus's identity by Jews today is that they were never expecting a Messiah that was God in human flesh. So the fact that Jesus claimed to be God shows that this wasn't, that he wasn't, isn't the Messiah, but that's not true. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that He's mighty God. A child, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, he'll be called everlasting father, prince of peace, you know, mighty God. So uh, they saw that. If, you're, if they're a true student of the scriptures, as, and as, as these people claim to be, you would know that. And also in Psalm 2, when it talks about kiss the son, lest he be angry, the whole verbiage there is talking about that he is the son of God there. So there's, there's this connection there to that he is he is the son of God and he claimed to be the son of God. Don't let anyone tell you that they didn't weren't expecting the Messiah to be the son of God. They they believed that. They believed that that the Messiah would sit on David's throne forever. How could he sit on David's throne forever? Because he is God. So, um it's important for us to 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 see that, but also he's trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. And he kind of feels like it's a win-win situation. Because if he denied that he's the Christ, then there's no reason to listen to him. And he's been lying all this time and they could discredit him. But if he claims to be the Messiah, claims to be the Christ, then they have him self-incriminating. You notice it doesn't have the second witness testify, at least in the record that Matthew records. So because it was like a shortcut. If I get him to admit it, I don't need witnesses. I could just have him you know, communicate that he is the son of God. So he thinks he has him. So now in Jesus' answer in verse 64 is interesting. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now there's a lot to Jesus' answer here. I want to unpack it a little bit. Um, he answers truthfully. Jesus says, it is as you said. So he says, true. He says, that's true. But he says so much more. He doesn't stop there. If you're going to ask a question, you're going to get the full answer with, with, with Jesus. And he uses 
one of his favorite titles to describe himself, the Son of Man. That was a messianic title. There's dozens of times where that's used in the Old Testament. It's always referring to the Messiah. And I want you to see here these different, you can't see it in the English, but in the Greek you can see it. They have, they have a way to make you, the word you be plural or singular by the ending that they have on the word. And it changes in verse 64. I want you to see where it says, it is as you said. The word you there is singular. So he's talking to Caiaphas. It is as you, Caiaphas, said. But then he switches to plural after that, the two other instances where it says the word you. Nevertheless, I say to you, you all, or y'all, he's not Southern, but you know, he's saying to you, you all, every one of you, all of you, hereafter you, again, plural, you all will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he's speaking to the whole leadership at that point. That the whole who's that, when that when that event happens, all of the Jewish leadership's going to see that. You know, in Acts chapter one, when they're amazed that Jesus ascended and the angel appears next to him and says, Why do you marvel at this? The same Jesus will come back the same way that he left. In other words, visible. Jesus warned in Matthew 24, they're gonna say, you know, um, look, he's in the inner rooms, or here he is, and he don't believe any of that. For like lightning is from the east to the west, so shall the Son of Man be visible to everybody. Basically, the gist of what he's saying. So the second coming, everyone's going to see it. It's going to be visible, and so uh, he he states that, and it's claiming to be God. It's claiming to be you're, you're the right hand of the power. I mean, you can't miss this. So, so, he, he's, and so he's really referencing, if you really look at it, I want to read to you a verse from, some verses from Daniel chapter 7. Da- Daniel seven thirteen and 14 says this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Hmm. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. You can't claim to be God any more than what he's claiming here, and the Messiah all at once. So they knew exactly what he's talking about. When Jesus said, you'll see the man, son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven, they knew exactly what he's referencing. They instantly thought of Daniel. They instantly thought of that chapter, chapter 7. We know what he's saying. And, and, and in reality, he's saying, I, my dominion is going to come back to this earth. Because in verse 64, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless. Yes, it is how you say, I am the promised Messiah. But I haven't come to, as the Messiah to dominate and to rule the world right now. That will come later. That's why he says, nevertheless, hereafter that's the key word hereafter the future is coming and and when the future happens you're going to see me enter into this realm again and i will set up my kingdom so you think that i'm on trial before you i'm not on trial before you ultimately you're only going to be on trial before me when i when my kingdom comes they got all of that. The message was clear. There was no ambiguity. They understood exactly what Jesus is saying. And that's why Caiaphas' reaction in verse 65 is this. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. The first thing is he violated the law by tearing his clothes. The high priest was never to tear his clothes. We're told that in Leviticus. Also, he, they would start with, he would never say what he thought first in these types of trials. He would let the youngest go first, and it would go up through the ages and, 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 and eldership until it got to the high priest. And he would usually comment lastly about a situation. Why? Because he didn't want to affect the judgment of the other people. He didn't want to influence them. He wanted them to judge the evidence on their merits instead of trying to influence the, their, their decision. He throws all that out the window. Not only does he rip his clothes, but he says he's guilty immediately before conferring with them. So, he did, you know, it's everything about this is, is a sham. But he asked him anyway in verse 66, what do you think? They answered and said, 
He is deserving of death. So they, they, it was unanimous, and, and that's a problem. Here are the ways this trial was illegal. The trial was at night. They weren't allowed to have these trials at night. If death was being presented as punishment, they'd have to wait 48 hours before rendering a verdict, a cooling off period. If it was unanimous, it was actually considered a mistrial because with that many people, with 70 plus the high priest there, that the likelihood of a unanimous all 71 saying that there, this was something, you know, uh, this was, you know, an airtight case, there's probably something wrong with this. And they would relook at it. Again, the high priest would give, give his verdict last. And the high priest wasn't supposed to tear his clothes. And then lastly, of course, false witnesses were illegal. These evil leaders weren't even trying to even have it appear. When, I mean, they were violating so many things. And these, these rules weren't, a, weren't lost on people. They didn't, it's not like they didn't know. They honestly just didn't care. And then look at what they did to God himself now in verses 67 and 68. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? It's so hard for us to read this because we love Jesus. We love his heart. We've seen his heart. John later in, in our study, he's going to say all the works, if they were all recorded, all the libraries couldn't hold all the books of how many great things that he did. And this, this hatred was so irrational. And it just shows you how wicked the human heart is. We can see, let people always, you know, in sharing your faith, oh, I, don't, I won't believe unless you show me if Jesus was right here in the flesh, then I'll believe. Like, no, they didn't believe then and he was right there in the flesh. They saw him do miracles and they didn't believe. See, the thing is, in our culture especially, people tr like to think that they're the biggest problem with Christianity are in the nature of the intellectual and the philosophical problems. But there's no problems with that. People are speaking from ignorance, first of all. They've never looked at the evidence. They've never looked at all the amazing evidence that's there for the veracity of the Bible. And, you know, there's a whole area of study you can get into called Christian apologetics and learn how to answer them and everything. But I, you know, and I was really into that as a new Christian because I was sharing my faith a lot. And they would come up with these things and I'd be like, I don't know. I got very comfortable saying, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll look into that, you know. And then, but I, I wrongly would was thinking that this is supremely a mind issue, when in reality, it's supremely a heart issue. Jesus didn't say men love darkness rather than light because their arguments are better. He said men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's a heart issue. People don't want to submit themselves to God. It's irrational to, 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 to think about it, but they, in reality, that's what they're really doing. Even God doesn't have the right to tell me what to do. He's the creator, though. He's the one that created everything. He has the right to, to mandate anything upon us. And, and again, it's a misunderstanding of what sin does. Sin's destructive. Sin's addictive. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. God's a loving father that wants to spare us the pain and suffering of sin. So the biggest issue is the heart. So what I do when I'm sharing my faith, when they bring up an issue... I will, if, if I, I have to really sense that it is sincere. If they're just throwing up smoke screens to try to get me off track or dismiss me or scare me off, that's one thing. But if they have a sincere question, I'll deal with that question quickly. And then I'll get back to where the power is at. The power is in the gospel. Romans chapter one, verse 16 says, it's the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. It's power. There's power behind that. The whole thing about apologetic reasons, those are great. Those are sometimes called pre-evangelism things that you're removing roadblocks to faith. There's all kinds of ways to describe it. But ultimately, it's a heart issue. And someone has to be really, really, really just, uh, lying to themselves to, to deny that they're a sinner, to deny that they've been less than perfect, to deny that they've sinned against God, that they've engaged in these activities. And, and that's what I so often focus on is dealing with the fact that they are a sinner. And one of the first things I do sometimes is ask them, hey, do you believe you're a sinner? Just, just to throw that out there. And Because if once they say yes, it's checkmate. Because now it's like, okay, you admitted you're a sinner. Now how are you going to get forgiven? 
You've sinned against God. Do you even care about how God says to be forgiven? And I mean, I don't say it in a mean way. I just would like, sincerely, do you really care uh, what God says is required to be forgiven? Can you get yourself forgiven by doing things to please God? Does it say that anywhere in Scripture? Getting him to think through that. Because honestly, if you think about how crazy that is, I mean, the, the Jews could have accomplished all the things that they're saying they can accomplish. They had a better law. They believed in God. They were religious people, but they couldn't, they couldn't meet the standard. And God sent this, the, the Savior, their Messiah, to die in their place too, not just us, because they couldn't meet that standard of perfection. Because once you fall short of that perfection once, that's it. You're disqualified. And you need God's forgiveness. So they, they are so angry at him. They spit in his face. Now, Jesus created this, the, the um, salivatory glands, or however you say it, the glands you use to create spit. He created those. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that he holds all things together by the word of his power. He's holding, he's the atomic glue that holds cells together. He's holding everything. When, when he destroys the earth and everything, he's just going to let it go. The first word you learn when you take Greek is luo, which means to loose. And it says he's going to loose it all. He's just going to let it go. And, and that, that's, that's going to be a, um, a really traumatic thing when he creates that new heaven and new earth. So he, he's holding everything together. Talk about meekness. The ultimate power under control. The creator being mistreated by the creation and they'd been wanting to do this for so long. This would have been building up. They wanted to, they couldn't do it before because of the people. They feared the people because the people loved him and, and respected him. And they're not going to risk their power, but they'd wanted to do this for so long. They finally had their chance. And Jesus willingly let them do it to him. You know, he didn't know where the punches were coming from. Other gospels say he was blindfolded. Didn't, couldn't brace himself for a strike and, and, and the spit and the, all these things. But yet all these things were prophesied. I want to read a couple of verses from Isaiah to you. 740 years earlier, Isaiah wrote this, inspired by the Spirit. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Amazing. He says, I gave my back, and I gave my cheeks. He gave it. And when you think about the fact that all of this was necessary for us, all of it, it was all necessary. And, it, and, and it's not meant to make us feel like self-condemning us, it's supposed to have us be thankful that he loved us so much that he'd be willing to do that. He was struck in the face. He took spit in his face. He's, this is just the beginning of what he's going to suffer. But it was all necessary. It was all for us. It was all necessary. The Father would never would have allowed this to happen if it wasn't necessary. And Jesus was submitted to it, to it all for us. And just shows you how John would later write in his epistle, we love him because he first loved us and gave himself for us. What a savior. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for going through what you went through for us. We can't imagine. We can't imagine what that was like. But we re remember your great heart. As you said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We recognize that the Apostle Paul said, I did the, those things ignorantly in unbelief. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for all the things you've forgiven us of. We thank you for wiping our slate clean, those of us that know you. Thank you for forgiving us of every sin we've ever committed. Thank you for paying for sins we haven't even committed yet. You've thought of everything, and we love you, and we want to live lives that are worthy of the sacrifice that you have made for us. We know we can't fully live that way, but we want to, and we can't wait to have a new body without a sinful nature. So we'd be free to, to love you completely as you're worthy of. We thank you that 
your word says that in the ages to come, we'll learn the riches of your grace. Thank you that for all eternity, even with our new bodies, we're going to be learning about the riches of your grace. We thank you. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.